I know. I didn't want to be on TV either. I'm out of the view, right? Maybe it's one of those wide angles. <laughs> I revealed to Barrett what you asked me. I already told 
It's just too small. It's in your head, boy. Did her take one away? No, it was significant. No, it was. Left in the dust. I will say, I counted. All right. Um, we're going to be looking at the new covenant as an aspect of, of the church. And the first place we're going to go is Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. Yeah, we'll see you in that. Jeremiah 31, the portion that we're looking at, is reproduced pretty much in Hebrews chapter 8, and it is the longest Old Testament quotation anywhere in the New Testament. So there. And uh, it's in the book of Hebrews, which is uh, Jews who were being tempted to, and some apparently actually fall into temptation, to go back into Judaism. And so one of the things that he spends time on in Hebrews, and in chapter 8 of Hebrews, is that we have a new covenant. It's not like the old one. Um, how many of you know or heard about or know anything about what Messianic Jews? Okay. Um, they're, they're, they're Jews who believe Jesus was the Messiah. But they follow Jewish things. Uh, they have rabbis. They have separate congregations like synagogues. And uh, they follow Jewish traditional things. And they go back and they still, they still believe in Torah. And I was listening to one lecture the other day. He, he was constantly talking about Torah. Uh, he, he liked to say Hebrew names as they should be pronounced. Every once in a while, they slip up and just call it what we call it. It's, it's hard to be consistent with that. Uh, but we can't, you couldn't be a Messianic Jew today. You couldn't be in follow Torah because there is a new covenant. So let's have a look at, at what we're talking about. Would anybody like to, who has a booming voice, like to read Jeremiah? Uh, Chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. If, if you would, I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't. I'll do it myself. The whole days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will, I will remember no more. Thank you. Uh, did, 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 were there any things that, that sort of that we got some in that here? Anything that popped out at you there uh, in, in, in Jeremiah as Barrett was reading that for us? First of all, it's not like the covenant that he gave. So it's not like well, almost it's not like the Torah. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. So we're looking for something that's not like it. One thing. What else? Did you, did anything else pop out at you? It reminds you of the book of Ruth. Hmm? It reminds you of the book of Ruth. <laughs> 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 that, that was you. I was reading it. <laughs> 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 reminds you of the book of Ruth. Okay. The 34th verse stands out. Okay. What stands out about it? And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know if you were uh, a Jew, ethnically, how did you, when did you become, how long were you alive before you officially got into that covenant situation? You're born into the, hmm? you're born into the old covenant. Well, you got, yeah, you're born into it. You got eight days, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, there you are. You got signed of the covenant. And uh, so you, you were born a Jew. You could theoretically be ignorant of God. In fact, obviously, because of the prophets, we know that oftentimes they were. So you could be a Jew just because you were born to a Jewish family. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, let me say this. 
a lot of times people today are what they were born into. They don't think about it. They don't reason about it. If you're born in this denomination, you say that, you know, that, that happens. Uh, but this is even more than that. This is actual official, you're in there type stuff. So, uh, how do you get to know? Or what, look, at, look at John 17, 3. John 17, 3. Because we're talking about they will know me. They won't have to be taught. People who are in this new covenant relationship will not have to be taught. I didn't mean there's never any teaching, but it, they don't have to be taught to be in this relationship. Okay, what, what does Jesus say here in this great high priestly prayer in John 17, verse 3, about eternal life? It's sort of That's sort of one of those things that pops out at you, I think, uh, when he says this, because uh, we probably wouldn't give that answer if we weren't thinking about this. So what does he say is eternal life? What, how, how would you sum it up? That they know the only true God. And, and, Jesus Christ. and Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ. Okay? So this is eternal life. So if you're in eternal life, what do you got to do? You have to know the Father and the Son. You can't be in an eternal life saved situation out of sin unless you know the Father and the Son. You've had to respond to something uh, that they have done, an initiative they've taken or things that they have taught. And in fact, first sermon on Pentecost People knew who the Father was. People knew who the Son was and who they were responding to because they learned that Jesus, whom they crucified, was the Messiah. So they enter into, as they're baptized, a relationship with the Father and the Son of knowledge and of determination and of acceptance, okay? So that's different from what we've got here. Now, you mentioned it reminds you of the book of Ruth. How does it do that? So she's making an adult declaration that she's going to follow God. She wasn't born into it. She's knowledgeably accepting the God of the Jews. And that, that's similar to in, in what she says. It's similar to what we're sort of saying. I'm, whatever this is, I'm going to accept it. And one of the other things that we can focus on is what the book of Hebrews really zeroes in on, how he calls it a new covenant. Mm -hmm. And if it's a new covenant, then the old one is going away. But right at the end, he adds something to the quotation of Jeremiah. It goes along with that. And he plays on the words new and old. And, and he said, now, when he says the new covenant, he's quoting where? Jeremiah. Okay, let's go back to Jeremiah. As far as what, what's happening in Jeremiah's life here, that's going to be very cataclysmic. Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. Jerusalem's going to be destroyed by the Babylonians, okay? Now... When Jerusalem is destroyed by the Babylonians, Ezekiel tells us about this, chapters 10 and 11, prior to the destruction of the temple, what happens to the Shekinah, the presence of God? It leaves the temple. It leaves. So when the temple is destroyed, God's presence wasn't there anymore, which is understandable. Now, when did they rebuild the temple? What, 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 what do we call that? During the Persians. Okay. Uh, they, they come back from Babylonian captivity, return from captivity, they had three waves of that, like they had basically three waves that went into it. And um, they have trouble building it. They're building their own houses. Haggai and uh, Zechariah are called to, uh, let's get this done, and you build your own stuff, let's take care of the Lord's business. And uh, eventually they get it done and it's dedicated, but there's something about it that is different from what it had been most of its existence. It had something missing, and not the ark, but, uh, but what? There's no presence of God. Which, he wants to open the ark, but he's not, there's not, none of that's there anymore. In fact, uh, when Pompey, or Pompey, uh, the Roman general goes in, he wants to say, why are these people dying for what's in that thing? He goes in there, what's in there? And then, it's empty. So they were wanting God's presence to come back, and it didn't come back. You remember in the, in the wilderness wandering when they do the tabernacle, God does fire and the pillar of fire and the pillar of uh, smoke, and they go inside, and that's God's presence, and that's where they remain. Well, it never comes back. Now, look over at Malachi. 
chapter 3. Let's we'll start with verse 1. Now, Malachi, or if you're Italian, Malachi. I just said that. My grandfather's Italian. Don't laugh. It encourages me to go. <laughs> Malachi, chapter 3. Okay, Malachi talks about John the Baptist, and he's talking about the coming of the Messiah, he's talking about when that's all going to get going again. And uh, so, chapter 3, verse 22, please. Behold, I'm going to send a messenger who will clear the way before me to the Lord who you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. In fact, what did John the Baptist say? He's going to refine, isn't he? Wheat and chaff? I mean, so he's, pro he's projecting forth to the time of the Messiah, preceded by the introduction of, of John uh, the Baptist, who Malachi uh, calls who? Hmm. Elijah. He's using that as a metaphor, so the simile. So, uh, but he says, you want that. You're looking, you want that. And he, he, he says, he'll come to the temple. Where do we read about that very dramatically happening in the Gospels? John 2. What, is he, what does Jesus say? He's there in the temple, right? It's still empty. And, and he basically says, it's because I'm here. Tear down this temple, and in three days, what? Well, you build this thing for forty-six years. It'd take another two and a half years to finish. But uh, and, and you're going to, and on the cross, and this is interesting because that's said in the Gospel of John. In the Synoptics, you have them mocking him for saying that. He said he could rebuild the temple, and look at him. He's dying a horrible death on the cross. Who do you think he is? Well. He is, the he is God with us. That's what the temple is about. The presence of God. All the presence of God with, with him in bodily form. And, and we are the temple to them. So all that takes place. But what Malachi says is you want that to happen. But do you really want it to happen? Because it's going to be a day of refining and judgment. And so the short answer to that is no, they didn't really want it to happen. And some of them did who profited from the Messiah's coming. But what happens, uh, and Jesus predicts it in, in Matthew 24, among other places, what's going to happen to the temple? The Jerusalem, the temple, is going to be destroyed. Okay? So, uh, I think God gave the Jews 40 years to figure it out before we just we're, we're, were taking this out. And so, uh, he, he tells them, he tells them, uh, when he's going up the Via della Rosa, the uh, way of the cross to be crucified, don't weep for me. What does he say? Just weep for yourselves. Because he's talking about what's going to happen to them and all that. So he has come as the fulfillment of the temple idea to bring in a new covenant. And those institutions of Judaism, such as the temple, that prefigured the things of the new covenant era, it's not the same covenant, were going to be brought into play by Jesus. Now, what are some other things besides the temple that were very physical? I mentioned one today in Neil's sermon with regard to David's contemplating what he could possibly do, and I'm sure he did, but that, that's not what God primarily wanted. He wanted a, a broken and contrite heart. What was he going to do? Sacrifice. Offer sacrifices. Do we offer sacrifices today that way? No, no. no. Why not? Hebrews right it goes to great lengths. So that there's only one, and it's been offered, and you don't do it anymore. Okay. Uh, can you think of anything else that was very outward that is now a more spiritual application? In fact, some of the things I've got down here we won't get, to get into. It talks about a restoration of Levitical priesthood. Well, that's, it doesn't mean the real Levitical priesthood any more than real Elijah was going to come. But it was symbolic of a priesthood that would endure. What's that all about? Well, that's us, right? We are a royal priesthood. Now, we are a holy nation, but we're not like Israel and Judah. And notice he says Israel and Judah. What he's saying, Israel and Judah, where's Israel, the northern kingdom? 
they're gone. They never came back from Assyrian captivity. Judah's about to be taken. They'll be brought back, but with an empty temple as a placeholder for Jesus to come and, and crank this back up. So the two are going to be brought together. Hosea and others talk about that as well in the new covenant. Hey, so this is going to be a new covenant. Now, what is a short way of talking about what the New Testament is? Or the, ah, go ahead. Uh, the new covenant is New Testament. Okay. Uh, now, is, does that is that different? I mean, let me just think about it. Old covenant, new covenant. There's some fundamental differences about not only the the content but how they're laid out, right? And uh, one of the things I think that we we sometimes maybe don't pick up on like we should. Uh, if we're going to be Christians, first of all, we got to know, right? We got to make that choice. Okay. Now, that in mind, look at Ephesians chapter four, verse fourteen. Ephesians four fourteen. And this is all going to get you in difference of cover. This one. We should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. It's not acceptable. It's not acceptable for a Christian in the new covenant situation. It's not acceptable for them to be immature. Now, they, they have to be for a while, but they are to long for the sincere milk of the word that can grow with respect to salvation. So if there's a person who has become a, a New Testament Christian and they have opted for immaturity. They have opted for an unacceptable thing. We're supposed to grow up. Now, if you read the next verse, please. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Okay. So that's that's our charge. And we've looked about all kind of things that say the same thing in different ways. Now, back to my story. Uh, the old covenant allowed for people to have profound spiritual relationships. So, I mean, when they had them, David's uh, uh, words in Psalm 51 shows that he had really gotten close to the Lord and it, it had a, an effect on him. He was a man after God's own heart and he, he comes to a moment of deep grief and repentance. Uh, but by and large, the laws of the old covenant are do this, don't do that. And they're often outward things like don't eat catfish, stuff like that. Uh, don't if you if you if you get near if you get near a body you got to be ceremonially unclean. Blood would make you all kind of things like that. In fact, uh, if you look at the end of Romans chapter five, Paul addresses that point uh, in a very good way. What did he say? Because there are people who are saying, "Let us continue in sin that grace may abound," which is not what Paul is teaching. However. When the old covenant came in, as far as the sin load that you were going to be carrying, if you were under the old covenant, did it increase or decrease? There were more things you could do wrong, weren't there? You had more responsibilities than you had. I mean, you could have, I guess, eaten a catfish before that, and everything would have been fine. So, and so, but he said, as that increased, grace increased. But it wasn't a, oh, it's continuous sin that grace may increase. It was the nature of the covenants, okay? Now, Back to our story. Um, look at um, well, don't look at that yet. Uh, the new covenant requires maturity to really get into it. Uh, we can teach it to our children, which we should, but abstract thought doesn't really kick in until you're about 12 years old. Hence, Jesus was that was his bar mitzvah year. That we read about it in Luke two. So he's given us a brain, and when we get to be adults, there's a part of the covenant that applies to us that doesn't apply to us in the same way when we're 10 years old, because we can't grasp it. But we are expected to grow up in the things of the new covenant, not to be children, but to grow up to maturity, okay? And the nature of the two covenants, the new covenant is more geared toward maturity, understanding a mature relationship with God than is the old covenant of itself. Questions or comments? Well, because it's more spiritual. More spiritual. Right. And the first covenant was physical. 
It was physical, but it wasn't totally physical. It was more physical. Yeah. It, it was emphasizing uh, physicality and presence and stuff you did with tactile, if you will. Who do we associate with tactile learning age-wise? Children. children. So it had, had a lot of children. Representation things like they had children. Again, the deeper aspects of it, we have to you know, grow beyond that. No longer to be as children. Okay? So this new covenant is for big boys and girls study, to process. If part of that is being transformed into the image of Christ, Romans 8, 29, and what you just read in Ephesians 4 and verse 15, then if we're capable of doing that, if you're not capable of doing it, there are people who can't do it because of whatever reason they, they do not have the mental capacity of going that far. That's fine. God doesn't expect them to do that. But uh, there, and there are one-time people, and there are five-time people, but God expects people to be transformed into the image of Jesus. That's not a tactile, go by the rules, do this, don't do that. Yes, there are rules, but it's deeper than that. You know, hopefully, hopefully, as adults, your, your, if you're married, your mate does not list the, the things on the board and put them up there, you know, Take out the trash. Maybe they did. <laughs> I might have gotten where I don't need to go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's, what you, that's what you get. Um, I, I, I know that there are certain things around the house that I cut the grass. I like cutting the grass. Well, this is my yard. Um, but, um, uh, is there that is? Yeah, well, every once in a while, somebody's coming over. She wants to make sure I'm not forgetting the grass. <laughs> Largely speaking, I, I just got grass. And um, uh, Sarah is the one who rolls the trash can out to the curb. That's I mean, I've done it every once in a while. But the, that's, I mean, she's there. She knows when, when the time comes on Wednesday night, she hauls it out and hopes they'll come around Thursday. Sometimes they do. Sometimes. <laughs> But we all have things like that. We do as adults. When we were children, we have to have talks. We have to have reminders. We have to have lists. We have to, lists are big with kids. We shouldn't have to have that many lists as adults. We should kind of grow into it. The new, the new covenant, as it talks about that, I just wrote an article for a good friend, <laughs> Brad Harris. He said, I want to come up and have a cup of coffee with you and just talk. I said, okay, Brad, you just better hurry up and do it then. Uh, but uh, I, I wrote an article for him on discipleship and how it covers everything. Because if I'm a disciple, if I'm a disciple, if I'm a follower of Jesus, if I'm being transformed into his image, if I'm adopting his mind to be my mind, if he's no longer I, but Christ lives in me, if that's the case, do I have a good relationship with God the Father? Okay, I've gotten that taken care of. Do I have good relationships with my fellow human beings? Yeah. All of those things that are a part of what I am to be as a Christian are things I will be to the extent that I am Christ-like, right? So that is a very adult concept. And, and unless we try for that, specifically try for that, it doesn't happen. So among other things, people need to know when they become Christians that they are becoming disciples. And that that's the end game, Christ's likeness. Mothers and daddies need to know that that's what you're wanting to instill in your children. So they will want to be like Jesus. That's what churches need to do in their Bible school programs along the way. This is getting you to a point, and because they're going to pass uh, that uh, magical age of 12 or 13 ish, where they get abstract thinking, while they're in our Bible school program, are they not? Is our Bible school program going to take advantage of the fact that they're now able to continuously and growingly uh, process things on an adult level? Or not? It should be. Well, of course we are. Because we've got a mission. We've got a job. We've got a charge. Make disciples. So this is a, this is a covenant, a new covenant. It's not like the old one. It's a new covenant of being a disciple of Christ who is transformed into his very image. The way we do what he does isn't just remembering things on lists. It's not just to pass the Bible bowl. As I must always say, I won't do it when the Bible bowl. But it's not just that. It's, 
inner transformation to where we buy into it. Paul, when he speaks of this in Galatians 2.20, he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And that's, that's at the heart of this New Covenant situation we're talking about. Anything else there, Jeremiah, about New Covenant that, that you want to talk about? They, uh, perhaps part of the reason why, I mean, obviously the New Covenant was planned all along, mm -hmm. but part of the reason, I suppose, for it coming when it did is that they broke it. They broke it. So what happens after the Babylonian captivity? There are things they can't do anymore like they could have done before, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're coming along doing what they can, but there's no presence of God in the temple. They don't even know what the ark looked like anymore. What's the Hebrews writer said? You know, kind of got a vague notion of it, but who knows? So uh, there were things that uh, were taken out of, of it. They could still practice the biggest part of it, but it was a flawed covenant from that point on in that respect. They've got a, a, a major feature of their covenant which is not functioning. They've got a temple that's supposed to house the presence of God, and it doesn't. So it was broken, and that was a consequence of it being broken. Now, uh, I, before I go into this long rant, I, uh, I mentioned old and new. Look at the end of this where he inserts after the quotation here in uh, Hebrews chapter 8. What does he say? When, when he said old, oh, I'll go back to where I, I watched a while ago. When, and he said it in Jeremiah's death. And he said it as the shadow of Babylon was hanging over them and as the, the temple was going to be destroyed. Uh, he says, when he said old, what, what, what started happening back in Jeremiah's day when he said old? If you got King James, you got one of my favorite words in there. What, what did the old covenant start doing when he said old? Oh. It started waxing old. What does that mean? Becoming obsolete. Growing old. It's, it's starting to grow old. It's starting to grow old. Okay? Uh, so it's it it's dying. As a covenant that's going to have anything, in, and what happens if you die? You eventually die. So it, it is. It is. It had a planned obsolescence, and it has kicked into that where they started needing something new real quick because it, it has some things in it that aren't there that need to be there, but they weren't there. So that should tell them, hey guys, you need a new covenant. Shouldn't it tell you that? But unfortunately. Uh, it didn't register with a lot of them. Well, it hasn't registered with a lot of them that continue to practice it today. With even less than they have before. I don't know. It's really bad thing. So, um, back to our, our different covenant. The, the maturity that is part of the new covenant. Uh, and the old one passing away and, and the new one coming up fact that this is a covenant that expects growth. It expects maturity. It expects people to make big boy and big girl decisions. Because what does it say will happen in Ephesians 4.14 if that doesn't happen? And you see it happening today, which must indicate that it doesn't always happen. Get tossed to and throw. Get tossed to and throw. By all the crafty people are going to be able to take advantage of you, right? Right. They, they wouldn't be able to take advantage of a no, no, no. They, they'd say, "No, oh, get out of here. I don't, don't come here with that." Where kids can go, "Oh, yeah, that sounds pretty cool." <laughs> but look, look at Eve in the garden. Look at this tree. Is she showing maturity there? No. She even says it looks like it would taste good. How does she know that? <laughs> Well, kids can be persuaded to make you wise. Really? Uh, just a little thought planted in there. And, you know? So we expect better things in our relationship in the new covenant. But again, it doesn't just happen. We have to deal with it that way. Okay, let's flash back to Jesus in Luke chapter 2. This is his bar mitzvah year. He is 12. 
from 12 to 13 is his bar mitzvah year. Son of the commandments. When he's 13, he is expected to read from the Torah in Hebrew, recite certain Jewish prayers, and, uh, and begin as his thinking is turning into more adult thinking, as conscious thought is becoming more part of his life, uh, that he would move into that realm and he would grow into taking responsibility for the covenant. So, uh, if a Jew is supposed to take responsibility for the covenant, then surely Christians are taking responsibility for the covenant. And while we don't have a, a bar mitzvah situation or a bat mitzvah, if you're a lady, we do have or should have something that is moving up to when, okay, now, they become a Christian. Different people, different times, but you are you you have decided that you, young man, young woman, that you are going to take responsibility as you can in your situation for being a covenant keeper. Okay? So one of the things about being baptized is you are taking on your level, having kind of crossed over to the beginnings of adulthood. You are you are now going to do what you can and progressively so. Now there we go. So what do we need to do with our young people when they get to that point? We need to give them stuff to do, right? Give them responsibilities so they can grow. We're concerned about our children being able to go out to the world and you know fend for themselves and buy houses and cars and get jobs and all that kind of stuff. And we do stuff to prepare for that, do we not? I mean, if they don't do that, if they're living in the basement until they're 47, we're thinking there's a problem here. And there is. Um, I never thought, isn't that a change? I was, in fact, I lived when I was 14. But most people were, were happy to get out when they got out of high school. They're not thinking, about, oh, my guy stuck here another little while. They're out of there. So, but there was more maturity back then. In, in my father's situation, even. I look at his high school annual. He was born in 1910. Everybody is a senior looks like an old man. I mean, they look like they're 42 years old. It's, it's crazy. Today, they look like they're eight or nine. It's, it's just things and things that going on. But um, that's it. We, we, need to, we need to have in church and in homes the ability to bring them into that so that when they do leave on their own, not only can they buy cars and have jobs and buy houses and, and marry people, but they can do serious adult Christian stuff because the world's going to try to take their whatever they got of Christianity away from them. In fact, we see this phenomenon, do we not, when we talk about dropout rights. What's going on with that? Well, they're not ready for the world, so they're getting tossed here and there, are they not? Because they're not ready for that, because they hadn't been brought up. But when they become a Christian, they need to start that maturity toward being in the world on their own as a Christian as well as, as a as a person with a job and making money. Thoughts? New covenant has implications that we need to uh, buy into and practice. I can't believe Sarah ratted me out. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was talking. When you compare, when you were considered as a royal priesthood, I think we, in our minds, got wrong image of what a priest is. When you think about the different jobs that the priests had to do in the Old Testament, you kind of, you know, the high priest was the clean guy. But you had to start at the bottom. Yeah. You had to get your hands through. Yeah. You had to work. get in and work. You had to go through the blood mm -hmm. to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And it's the same like today. And I think we got in our minds uh, uh, not a good image of what an actual it's a good priest what's it well, we're to be a, a royal priest as you said Romans 12 1 and 2 we're to give ourselves as a what living sacrifice what does that look like well it doesn't look like la di da I'll tell you that that's serious stuff it's, it's the kind of things we've been talking about that have to do with a mature religion a new covenant religion a, a religion of transformed men and women into the image of Christ and uh, if, if we send folks out when they're 18 or so, and, and they hadn't really gotten into that pretty well, and that transformation isn't understood 
or working, you know what's going to happen. So it's up to us to do something about that so that it won't happen. And that doesn't mean it won't happen because Christians fall. 40 year old Christians fall. 70 year old Christians fall. But you to be fortified to keep you from falling. And here's the thing it can't be a don't do this based religion. It's got to be a positive based religion because don't do doesn't stay with you. Don't do doesn't give you encouragement. Don't do doesn't give you a reason for living. Don't do is, is negative. And in fact, some people will say, if I become a Christian, I won't be able to have any fun. Don't do, don't do is bring attention to the don't do's. Part, 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 pardon me saying this, but the do's, uh, <laughs> they cover the don't do's, don't they? Okay, because every, you can't do the opposite of the thing you're supposed to be doing that's good while you're doing the thing that's good, right? So it covers it. On the other hand, if you're not doing the thing, if you if you're not doing the thing that you shouldn't do, that doesn't mean you're doing the good thing. Except when my grandmother got the saying of, you know, the idle hands or the devil's tool. Yes. It is true. You need to be busy, but but you need to be busy in the Lord's work. That, that's how you grow into it. That's how you're able to cope with the world. The world's just a nasty place. Colossians two. 20 through 23, all about that. Yes, the rules do not touch, do not pay, do not handle. They, they have an appearance of wisdom. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they don't do anything. Nobody That's a good does. point. Paul says all this do not handle, do not touch, it looks like it's wise. At the end of the day, that's all it is. It doesn't accomplish its purpose. They wind up doing those stuff. All right, thank you.